on. So, a very warm welcome to uh, Tackle Tart Fishing Lockdown. Uh, I've got a very special guest on this, this episode, you'll be pleased to see. Uh, I've got uh, Stuart Scooby Cochran, and we're going to be talking a little bit about his book. And we're going to be talking about Lifeline and some of the things that Tackle Tart Fishing Lockdown um, is all about. So, warm welcome to you, Scoops. Yes, Sean. Thanks for that. Anyway. So, um, what's what's kind of interesting about the subject we're talking about today is is that this has been an evolution. So, way back when the first lockdown occurred, pretty much a year, fifteen months ago, um, I could see that some of my fishing friends, in particular, were starting to feel a bit isolated in the lockdown. You know, we weren't able to go fishing, we weren't able to go out or socialise. And I wanted some way of trying to keep them connected with a bit of banter, you know, some funny photos and videos. And I started doing these daily uh, blogs. And Tackle Tart was all about sharing the, the, the daft equipment and tackle and gear that we've got and the experiences that we have. And I was sending these out on a private WhatsApp. And we were all getting a giggle out of it and trying to keep connected. Um, because, you know, when I looked at the friendship group and the people that we live with in this, uh, in this village, um, a lot of us felt pretty isolated over the last year. You know, some of our support mechanisms have been kicked away by the restrictions. And you could see that people were going through a series of downers and disappointments. And there was plans and promises that were just unfulfillable. And um, I think it kind of brought to my mind that uh, maybe in times like this with a lockdown, um, everyone has a backstory. Everyone has a tough life to deal with. Everyone's different. But everyone has some particular challenges that they've got to get through. So um, working with uh, Paul Chisholm, the founder of Lifeline Angling, um, I got to meet uh, Scooby. And um, this is really what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about his life and some of the things that he's used to be a kind of self-survivor. You know, how do you take responsibility for your own health, your own well-being, your own fun? Um, how do you keep connected, not just with yourself, with your friends and also the outdoors? And that's the key strap line that we have in Lifeline Angling. It's all about education in the outdoors. We're looking to really help young people to reconnect with the great outdoors through mentorship from Paul in particular, through fishing, through eating barbecue food and eating loads of sweets and chatting and telling stories and, uh, you know, sharing Haribo and flumps and, uh, and all, all manner of other uh, high E number sweets. So um, we're going to be running some events over the summer uh, that support uh, youngsters getting back into uh, sport and the outdoors and fishing, and obviously using Paul's really expert skills in mentorship to help them get back on their way. So um, this is really what uh, Lifeline Angling is about. And today we're going to be talking uh, to Scoobs about the process that he's been through. So here's his book. Um, I have to admit, I'm only about halfway through it because I've had to reread some of it. It's absolutely hair raising, hair raising. Uh, written in 2018. Is that right, Scoobs? I say, yeah, yeah. And it covers a period actually where I just about uh, left school and university and was just about getting into my first uh, job. And while you were enjoying yourself, Scoobs, I was having children, wearing a tie and working in, in a pharmaceutical factory. So I missed an awful lot of this. I've actually regressed. I'm much more uh, lively than I was back in my 20s, actually. So we we're quite an interesting contrast, the two of us. But I think what's interesting about the, the story there is that you've had um, a series of really successful, innovative businesses. You know, you, you were a trailblazer. And I I'd like you to talk us through, you know, that process. But also, you've been to some dark places as well, and you've been able to clamber yourself out of those dark places and, and survive it. So uh, it'd be really good to sort of get a bit of background about that, uh, that era and your part in it. And I suppose, ultimately, how you uh, helped yourself survive, you know, what was five lifetimes? So, so what was it all about? It's really, it's really strange. I mean, I think about the, the whole thing. Uh, the, the nearest thing I can think about was that my life, years and years ago, there was an advert for Volkswagen Gogs on the telly. 
and the woman came out the casino and she put it all in red and it turned up black and she'd lost a lot. Uh, and I always remember that I was young at heart with the bluebells, I was a single, I was playing as well. And that's what I felt my life was like, you know, I put it all in red and it came up black. But I've been a survivor. Um, I've seen 36 different psychiatric units. I've been sectioned 23 times and I've been locked up for 1,276 days, which is three years, six months and a week. We can only but imagine. It's a story. Yeah, yeah. But it's a story from there down to the de depths. But it's also a story of hope and redemption for me because now I've been well for 13 years. So I've been from, I remember a German psychiatrist saying to me that I was the worst patient he ever had. Uh, and now I've showed them wrong, I've managed to get through it. That's brilliant, that's brilliant. I mean, we can only imagine what you've gone through there, Scoops. I mean, if you've got any toolkit or anything that you've been able to use to try and get yourself out of that kind of cycle, yeah, I think you learn things along the way, and there's wee snippets of, of, of things that, that, that I use. Uh, but I work really hard every day. I do a lot of holistic stuff. I uh, take loads of minerals and vitamins. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a Buddhist. I, I practice Buddhism, so I do quite a lot of meditation as well. Uh, and, yeah, it, it's, it's great. It's just a case of working hard every day. Every day is a recovery day yeah. when you can. You know, I would, I would say, and what you're saying there, I've got a mantra. There's like four things that I remember every day, John. And the first thing is, is that I've accepted my illness. I've accepted I've got chronic bipolar. I never, ever did that before. I've taken responsibility in my illness. In 13 years, I've never missed a tablet. Before, when I thought I was getting better, I would throw the tablets away. Right. The, th the third thing is I've got three triggers. Uh, one of the triggers is smoking. If I buy a packet of cigarettes, I know I'm in trouble. The second trigger is less than six hours sleep, believe it or not. And the third trigger is social media. I've never been on social media in three years, and it's been the most liberating thing I've ever done. Oh, it can be really toxic, can't it, social media? Yeah. The last thing in my mantra, and this is the fourth thing, and this is the thing that people forget about, John, is that people go in well and then they get better and then they forget about it. But what I still realise, and I wish somebody told me this 20-odd years ago, I've only worked it out a couple of years ago, is that I am still vulnerable. But knowing your vulnerability is a strength, it's no a weakness. So that's it, it's acceptance, responsibility, triggers and vulnerability and those things are paramount in my head every day but changing your life starts with you doesn't it actually starts from within exactly you know, and you've yeah. got to take responsibility for yourself i mean i often talk to my kids and they say well dad what can you do to help me well you've, you've got to work out ways of helping yourself as well yeah and, and and the other thing that you've got to do as well is that when you're when you're when you're in that bad place there is that and one of the first steps of recovery is you need to come out of your comfort zone and take a wee risk. Mm -hmm. and that's super important. Uh, I worked as a peer support worker with the, with the health board for years, and that's one of the things I used to say to them, like, to my, to my, when I was up with the peers, you need to take a risk and come out of your comfort zone. That's really hard when you're in a place, a dark place, but that's a starting point as well. And there's a nice link, I think, as well with mindfulness, with, with fishing, actually, because you do yeah. get into the zone and you start to really concentrate on really simple but beautiful things. And it just takes you out of yourself. And, and I, I really believe that mindfulness is, is a fantastic tool, isn't it? Oh, it's strange. You know, one of the things I think you're going to ask me is what do you wish I'd done sooner? Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is mindfulness. Now, basically, mindfulness, um, it was written by a Buddhist. Mindfulness was written by a Buddhist. And mindfulness is basic Buddhism. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've been practicing Buddhism for nine years now. Mm -hmm. So the mindfulness and the Buddhism go hand in hand for me. And it works really, really well. 
I, every morning I get up and I chant for about an hour and it puts me in such a good place for the rest of the day. Um, and it's great. It's completely changed my life. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of uh, anglers will really uh, resonate with that because sometimes our lives can be so manic and, and so full on. Actually getting yourself on uh, the river, listening to the sound of the water, watching the leaves floating down the river. You just go to a much calmer place. Yeah. There's, there's loads of different styles of Buddhism. The, the Buddhism I practice is called Nichiren Buddhism. Mm-hmm. Uh, we believe, like the wee fat guy with the belly, and that we don't worship a, a god or the wee guy. or anything. There's nothing like that. What we believe is that the Buddha is in yourself. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a new, it's no, it's not an icon or any of that. And also what's great about the Buddhism I practice is that there's no rules. You know, you can do what you want. They're not telling you to shave your head or be a vegetarian. Just live the best life you can. You can yeah. be and see the best in people. Yeah. And it's common sense and it's, it's an incredible way of life. Yeah, it does sound great. So let's reel back to, to that period in the 80s when I, when I really should have been out there at clubbing and I wasn't. <laughs> <clears throat> Tell me something about those businesses that you worked with and, and how you set them up. I mean, you've, you've been in all the best places. I can see that. Yeah. Uh, I was, I hate saying this, I was always ahead of my time, John. You know, I was, if I'd been, and that was back in the 70s and the 80s, I was always a couple of years ahead in what I was doing. If it had been today, I'd probably be diagnosed with ADHD. Because I was that, you know, that's the kind of person I was. You're really high I energy, went, aren't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I went to Ibiza in the 80s, 81, and I was working 83. I was DJing in Ibiza. The whole Ibiza scene didn't start until 87. So I was there four years ahead of everybody else. Right. Uh, came back, started running a, a successful all night raves in Glasgow. That was 92. I was working with people like. Pete Tong and Moby and you know these sort of guys. Then I had uh, my first breakdown was in '93. Ran away back to Ibiza. Uh, ended up a pal of mine wanted to open up a bar, and he wanted to call it Sunset Cafe. And he had a site and all that. Don't really like the name. And what we could do maybe there's a wee cottage here. If we could get the old lady, think outside the box, get the old lady a property buy this cottage, that's a place to have the bar. Uh, and uh, we did that, we managed to get the lady a, a, a flat, they got the property. And at the time I was wearing Australian surfwear, uh, I was wearing loads of Australian surfwear and I said, uh, why not call it Mambo? So I was the guy who was actually behind Cafe Mambo and, nice. and I beat that, it was there. But unfortunately I went unwell and I had to come home. Mm-hmm. And I was meant to get a percentage of the bar, but still friendly with the guys. I still see them. Uh, they've done really, really well for themselves. They've now owned 19 businesses in the island. They're, they're massive. Eh? You must feel immensely proud of your contribution there. And actually, when you think of all the people whose lives you've touched, you know, the holidays and experiences that people have had, you know, in your clubs, you know, not just in Ibiza, but in the UK as well. People have had some of their best times, thanks to you. And it's strange because I used to DJ as well, John, in loads of places too. Eh? And the amount of people that came up and say, I met my wife there when you were DJing in that club in Stirling. Uh, yeah. I met my wife and I was, you know, down the other and that. We're together 20 years and that. It's, it's lovely. It's really nice. Yeah, it's nice. So given all of all of that success that you'd had and you, you, you'd had success, you'd reached a peak, for a variety of reasons, it stopped. And then you just started again. You, you did it again. You created new innovation, new new um, events and, and new venues, you know, in series. Yeah. Like, you know, I've picked that up from the book. Was there anything, looking back, that you wish you'd stopped doing a bit sooner? Uh, to be honest, I've not regrets, you know, and I'll tell you why. If I'd stopped doing something... I'd be lying six feet under in a box and I'd be sad. I'd have killed myself, you know, and I know that. And I look at where I am now in my life, John, and I have an incredible life. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy. No, I'm not happy. There's a difference between happy and content. You know, 
a difference between happy and content, and I'm content, and it's great. I don't want a bigger telly or a mm. fancier car or any of that. I'm happy with my lot and my partner and my wife and what I've got in about me. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, and all those experiences and achievements you've got up here, no one can ever take them away from you, can they? No, 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 no. It's fantastic. No, no. So what about um, in the f- looking into the future? Is there anything you'd like to do more of in the future? Yeah, there is. Um, Gandhi was really, I made a really famous saying years and years ago, and basically Gandhi said, was be the change you wish to see. And, and I, want to, I want to be the change that I want to see in people. Yeah, be the change you wish to see. That's a really powerful statement. You know, it's, it's seeing the best in people. Uh, mm. Sometimes that's hard. You know, when you, you, you've been there, people, you've known people a long time, or they're, they're kind of shitting in the air, but, be whatever, but I want to see the best in people, and I want to be the change that I wish to see. Nice, nice. And anything you'd like to do a bit less of in the future? Any like the <laughs> junk food. <laughs> okay. me, me and you both. Uh, I was 17 and a half stone before the lockdown, and then I lost four stone. Get away. Uh, How have you done that? Yeah, just through walking and diet as well. We've been eating really well, eating good food, got to do the takeaways, got to do the junk food, and really reconnecting again with the, with the world. I was the laziest guy in the world, by the way. I can remember years ago, I, I joined first day this big hotel opened up in, in town. They had a health club and I, and I joined the health club and I used to go in every morning and have a sunbed, I would get ready, I would then go and sit for 12 minutes in the jacuzzi because that's how long it took. I would do one length of the swimming pool and I would then go and have a shave in the sauna, come out, have a shower and get ready. And that's how I started my day every day and they made a wee plaque for me and it's saying that I was undoubtedly the laziest man in the health club. <laughs> Well, that's that's brilliant. I mean, to to lose that much weight and get that much fitter, that's that's brilliant. You will have yeah, to give me some tips off off screen on how to do that. I could do with some of that myself. Yeah. So, thinking about uh, lifeline angling and the work that Paul's doing, I mean, it's so worthwhile and it's it's so timely as well at the minute. If there was something you would like to see young people do that would help them reconnect with the great outdoors, yeah, you know, what would it be? it's really easy man this is super simple and I think I don't understand I've got grandkids eh? so I see them as well eh? just lift your head at the screen just take a look up for the screen you might see the grass you might see this the sky you might see plants you might see birds you might see fishing but just lift your head up because the screen because it's magical there's a whole world out there that you, kids have forgot about now mm. too much it's about roadblocks and games and god knows whatever and uh, just lift your head up the screen there's more magic outdoors isn't there than what you're ever going to see yeah yeah, yeah 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 no doubt about it <clears throat> i mean for me personally um over the last couple of years i've i've read and reread this one and um, there's a couple of key messages in there. One, I think, which chimes quite well with you as well. Because for me personally, sometimes I can care too much about stuff that's going on outdoors, uh, you know, out in the wider world. I can be a bit manic, a bit obsessive at times. I mean, people say that I'm obsessed with fishing. Probably I am. But sometimes that um, ties me up in knots a little bit. So I've used this book a couple of times to work out a couple of little tips that work for me. And the first one, pretty simple, really is that you've just got to kind of work out what you really love to do in life and do more of it. You know, maximise the amount of time where you're actually doing things that, that you're enthusiastic and that you love. And then conversely, the things that you really don't like, just try and minimise them. I know you can't always cut everything out of your life that you don't like doing, you know, like work. But... <laughs> But um, if you can minimise it in some way, you tip that balance and make life that much more attractive, don't you? Just do as much as you can in the things that you really love doing. And then the other key tip in his book was about um, surrounding yourself with people who are um, proactive, inspirational. They are energy givers. 
um, and try and minimize the amount of time that you spend with energy suckers because you know we all we all have people who continually suck in the air and the positivity out of life and to some degree you've got to support and help them but <clears throat> you've got to be careful that they don't sap all the energy out of you as well so does that does that chime with you at all scoops it's exactly 100 percent. i call it something a little bit different what you're saying there john for me it's radiators and drainers and um be surround yourself with radiators people who radiate and keep away from the drainers man you know they're, 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 they're yeah, radiators and drainers. I've, I've always maintained that radiators and drainers. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I like that. Yeah, good. So the other thing we talked about off air was this uh, concept of fifty-one percent days. Tell me about that as well. That, I love this. Yeah, but what, what I always felt was when I, when I was struggling, you know, people always say that on a scale of one to ten, where are you? Or four, five, or the rest of it. But I always make sure that I have a fifty-one percent day. Now that 1% is it's just 1%, but it's the right percent on the right side of feeling better. You know, so if you're sitting at 46 or 4 out of 10 or be whatever, go and do something about it. It's not that hard. Phone a friend that you get on really well with that'll lift your spirits up, play a bit of music that you love, go and read a passage out of a book of one of your favourite authors, you know, make a baking sandwich. I don't know, just do something to make you feel that 51 and when you go to bed that night you're on the right side of things and tomorrow's another day that's right we all start with a clean sheet every day don't we yeah yeah yeah. No, i really like that so i can tell that you and i'd like to uh, do as much as we can to live in the moment and trying to get the best out of what is sometimes a bit of a rocky road that we're on yeah. that was so interesting scoops i really enjoyed that uh, thanks so much for your time and i'm really hoping we're going to get to meet on the bank sometime with paul yeah, great one. Looking forward to it. <laughs> great stuff. Well, thanks so much again. Um, I'm going to put all the uh, links at the bottom of the um, of this YouTube clip. So that would be Lifeline Angling. Um, it'll also be, of course, for Tackle Tart Fishing Lockdown. And I think there's also a link uh, that we're going to put up there on a documentary about Scoobs' life um, th that was, that was uh, filmed. And I'm sure people will get a lot of uh, interest and support out of that as well. So once again, Scoops, that was top, top class. Thanks so much. Um, no problem, man. And what, what do you say in the book? Is it keep on gliding? Big loving, Steve. <laughs> like it. Nice one.